So tonight, we talk about the last things, which are, so the last things. Death, happy topics, right? Judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, and then resurrection of the dead. Now, the way to understand this is that our life on is not it. We believe that there is an eternal life. This idea of a, an immortal soul is something that even the ancients like Aristotle, Plato thought of. There has to be something more to us than just this physical being, so we have a soul, but there also has to be something more than this world. So the idea of an everlasting life precedes Christianity. And of course, the Jewish people believed this too. So when we think of the church, we look at, yes, the church here on earth, but also the church in heaven and the church going through a purification in a place we call purgatory. So in this idea of church, we have what is called the church militant, from the Latin miles, meaning soldier. It's the idea that we're doing the good battle. We're fighting the good fight. So here we are building up the kingdom of God, running the race, keeping the faith. But then we believe that we don't just end here, but rather we pass from this life to everlasting life. So there is the church triumphant, which are all the saints and angels in heaven that are united with God. But then there's also the church, we call it the church suffering. But I really don't like that because it's, if it's a suffering, it's really more of a purification kind of suffering. So I like to think about it, the church being purified. But again, you'll see this term suffering. So with that in mind, what happens after this life? So the fact is, we do face death. We know that. It happens. As Benjamin Franklin once said, there's two things that are unavoidable, death and taxes, and how true that is. So at some point, our life ends. But it's not an end of life, except in this world. So the idea of a passing makes sense that our soul separates from our body. So the soul, remember, is who we are. So this body is a being, but it is animated by the soul. That life in us is our soul. Who we are is our soul. When we think of our personality, our talents, our gifts, all of that, it's our soul. So, the soul separates at death, and then we face judgment. Jesus spoke of this. So every person faces what is called the particular judgment, meaning it's particular for each one of us, that we have to give an accounting of our life. St. Paul, in his second letter to Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 10, wrote, the lives of all of us are to be revealed before the tribunal of Christ so that each one may receive his recompense, good or bad, according to his life in the body. Then recall the gospel passage we had just three weeks ago on the Feast of Christ the King, where it's the day of judgment, and Jesus separates the good from the bad, the sheep from the goats. And the idea here is we face a judgment. We have to give an accounting of our life before our Lord. Now, with that judgment then, we're going to enter one of three places. Heaven, 
hell, or purgatory. So heaven is perfect union with God. When we think of heaven, a soul that has, so a person who has died in the faith, who is filled with sanctifying grace, who has no sin and has no hurt caused by sin that needs to be healed, that person will be welcomed into heaven. There, the person has the beatific vision, meaning the beautiful vision, seeing God face to face. So if we go to just a little excerpt of the Catechism, we read, the perfect life with the most holy trinity, the communion of life and love with the trinity, with the blessed Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the saints, is called heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness. With God's grace, we must strive to continually convert our lives and grow in holiness so that one day we too may enter into the heavenly rest of the Lord. Now that's a very beautiful passage because it just simply captures that when we leave this life, we're in this state of perfect happiness in union with God. Now consider this. What's happening? Here on earth, we have faith. We believe in God. We believe in what has been revealed to us, especially through our Savior. We strive to live that. In heaven, faith gives way to vision. We see it for what it is. To say, I believe in God. That's wonderful, but I have to admit, I've never really seen God. I haven't had the privilege of a revelation of some kind. But in heaven, everything we've believed, we see. So that's the vision. And then the hope we've had here, that trust in the promises of everlasting life, of mercy, of forgiveness, all of those things, we come to possession. We possess the promises. They're fulfilled. And then the love that we have shared now with God comes to perfection. We're in perfect love with God. Keep in mind, too, that heaven is timeless. It's, you know, we're out of time. That meaning, <laughs> we are out of time, but we're out of time, meaning we're out of this time and space. I've had, you know, especially teaching like eighth graders and so on, they always ask, well, heaven's going to be awfully boring if all you do is sit there and, you know, be with angels and saints and what's there to do and so on. Well, we aren't in time anymore. You know, it's like you're in perfect presence of God. So it's timeless. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, it is the mystery of the Trinity which gives answer to the quest for our happiness and the meaning of heaven. Heaven is not a place where there is a mere vocal repetition of alleluias, or the monotonous fingering of harps. <laughs> heaven, I love Fulton Sheen. Heaven is a place where we find the fullness of all the fine things we enjoy on this earth. Heaven is a place where we find, in its plenitude, those things which slake the thirst of hearts, satisfy the hunger of starving minds, and give rest to unrequited love. Heaven is the communion with perfect life perfect truth, and perfect love. That's beautiful. You know, and I think that, God willing, one day, if I get to heaven, how wonderful it's going to be, not only to see the Holy Trinity, but you think of the saints, you know, the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, all these saints that we've had devotion to, how wonderful it will be to be with our guide in the faith. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and hit him. Go ahead, hit him, Carmen. 60. <laughs> this is what, see, Carmen's the saint, which proves it. Here. Anybody knows about purgatory, 
Carmen, you can see, has gotten through the purgatory. So, well, she's still struggling through purgatory. Oh, first. <laughs> All right, so, see, I got sidetracked. So, if a person, by his own free choice, has rejected God, rejected God's truth, chosen to commit what we call mortal sins, serious sins, and has no remorse, no contrition for those sins, well, that alienation from God, that choice to become alienated, is accepted by God. So God doesn't put anyone in hell. God wants all people to be saved, meaning to enter into heaven. But God respects our choice. So if a person rejects God now, turns his back on God, God accepts that. That's the free choice. God does not force us to love him. God doesn't force us to hate him. We choose. So people who, are, who end in hell put themselves there. Now, hell is a place of eternal punishment. It does have suffering, suffering of sense and suffering of loss. So there will be punishment, sensible punishments in hell, but the most or the worst is that there will be the loss of love. There's no love in hell. So that is the worst part. Now, if we look then to just what Jesus said, he does speak about Gehenna and so on. So in Matthew chapter 18, verse 8. Well, our Lord says, if your hand or your foot is your undoing, cut it off. Doesn't don't mean that literally, but take drastic action and throw it from you. Better to enter life maimed or crippled than to be thrown with two hands or two feet into endless fire. If your eye is your downfall, gouge it out and cast it from you. Better to enter life with one eye than be thrown with both into fiery Gehenna. And then going back to that scene in Matthew 25 with the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, I assure you, as often as you neglected to do it for one of these least ones, you neglected to do it to me. These will go off to eternal punishment and the just to eternal life. So the Jews had the idea of hell, and they did refer to it as Gehenna. Gehenna actually is a valley along the perimeter of Jerusalem. It was a place where when the Jewish people went astray about the year 600, they offered infant sacrifice to a pagan god named Moloch. Because of that, after they repented and so on, Gehenna became like a big trash heap. It was known to be like constantly smoldering with fire. So you can imagine like a trash heap, just this combustion that takes place and it's just always burning. So you have this evil place. Judas committed suicide in the Valley of Gehenna. So I've seen it from a distance. So if you go to the house where Caiaphas was the priest, you can look down into the Valley of Gehenna. And it's really quite a spooky feeling that one gets. But hell has been seen by some saints. One was Sister Faustina, canonized saint. And she records this vision. She says, today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of tortures I saw. The first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is that one's condition will never change. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it, a terrible suffering, as it is a purely spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth torture is continual darkness, 
and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and souls of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of others and their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together. But that is not the end of these sufferings. There are special tortures, tortures of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of torture where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity in those senses which he made us of to sin. I am writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find an excuse by saying there is no hell or that nobody has ever been there, and so no one can say what it is like. Now, other saints too, like Padre Pio or the children at Fatima, they also had visions of hell. The reason why God permitted that was in a way to shake us up, to open up our eyes and reflect on life, especially if someone's going astray. When I read Sister Faustina, who was known as the advocate of divine mercy, for one thing, when I read it, though, I thought immediately of Dante's Inferno of the Divine Comedy. Dante got it right, you know, when you think about it. But spiritually speaking, what's happening in hell, like in heaven, you've got this eternal present in the presence of God. In hell, you have eternal past. All you see is your sin and the sins of others. There's no hope, no hope in hell. That's why Dante captured it properly when he said, over the gates of hell are written, abandon all hope ye who enter here. There's no hope. Once you're in, you're in, that's it. But it's the choice that the person made. That's always the key. You know, people do not repent in hell. Sometimes that's been asked too, can you repent in hell? No, you can't repent because you've made that irrevocable decision. It's sort of like, I think too, of the criminal who gets arrested and who does he blame? Everybody but himself. And that's what's going on in hell. They'll blame God, they'll blame everyone, but they don't blame themselves. So the intensity of their sin increases. Now, with that, there's purgatory. So if a soul dies in a state of faith and grace, but still has venial sins or hurts caused by sin, God is just, so he holds us accountable, but God is also merciful, infinitely merciful. So God is going to heal that soul. That's the idea of purgatory that it's the purification, the healing, the purging, so that once that venial sin is forgiven and the hurt caused by sin is healed, that soul can go to heaven. Now, the Jewish people had a sense of this because we look at the books of the prophets and they oftentimes called or talked about our soul being like fire-tried gold. I always wondered what that meant. You know, fire tried gold. When I was in Jerusalem back in 2000 with a group of students from Christendom College, we were in the Holy Land. So we were walking through the streets of Jerusalem. And in this one area, there are just lots of gold shops, religious goods stores, and so on, but especially gold shops. And they sell religious metals, things like that. So we went in one, and there's this. I presume, I think, a Jewish goldsmith, and he held a gold nugget between his forceps, and he was holding the nugget in a Bunsen burner, so big, intense flame. So one of the kids asked, what are you doing? And he said, I'm burning out the impurities. So, well, how do you know when it's done? And the old goldsmith said, when I can see myself in it. 
I thought that's purgatory. When God can burn out with healing grace all those impurities in our soul, heal the hurts caused by our sin, and really see clearly that image and likeness of His in which we are made, that's when we're ready to see, to go to heaven. I think of it too like, you know, I need glasses to see. But frankly, by the end of the day, there's smudges, there's dirt, there's dust, whatever it may be on these glasses. They've got to get clean. Well, those of you you know, it's, the vision's not as good. But clean your glasses, things get much more clear. Well, that's what purgatory is. It's a place of cleansing, the lens of the soul, so that we can see God. Very beautiful. And I'm going to read something. It's a little bit long, but it's from Pope Benedict. And it was in his encyclical, Saved in Hope. And he talks about purgatory. Who, what? Hmm? I heard something. Nope. All right, so Pope Benedict writes, With death, our life choice becomes definitive. Our life stands before the judge. Our choice, which in the course of an entire life takes on a certain shape, can have a variety of forms. There can be people who have totally destroyed their desire for truth and readiness to love, people for whom everything has become a lie, people who have lived for hatred and have suppressed all love within themselves. This is a terrifying thought. But alarming profiles of this type can be seen in certain figures of our own history. Think of Hitler, Stalin, Mao. In such people, all would be beyond remedy and the destruction of good would be irrevocable. This is what we mean by the word hell. On the other hand, there can be people who are utterly pure, completely permeated by God, and thus fully open to their neighbors, people for whom communion with God even now gives direction to their entire being and whose journey towards God only brings to fulfillment what they already are. Well, that's heaven. Yet we know from experience that neither case is normal in human life. For the great majority of people, we may suppose, there remains in the depths of their being an ultimate interior openness to truth, to love, to God. In concrete choices of life, however, it is covered over by ever new compromises with evil. Much filth covers purity, but the thirst for purity remains, and it still constantly reemerges from all that is base and remains present in the soul. What happens to such individuals when they appear before the judge? Will the impurity they have amassed through life suddenly cease to matter? What else might occur? St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, gives us an idea of the differing impact of God's judgment according to each person's particular circumstances. He does this using images which in some way try to express the invisible without it being possible for us to conceptualize these images, simply because we can neither see into the world beyond death, nor do we have any experience of it. Paul begins by saying that Christian life is built upon a common foundation, Jesus Christ. This foundation endures. If we have stood firm on this foundation and built our life upon it, we know that it cannot be taken away from us even in death. And then he goes on about Paul and so on. So continuing on, he says, Some recent theologians are of the opinion that the fire, which both burns and saves, so this is a different kind of fire from hell. It's more of that purifying fire. Sort of like, you know, if you wanted to sterilize an instrument in an emergency, put it in the fire. You can cauterize things with that instrument but it also sterilizes. Or like my mom, who was a nurse, said, in the operating room in the old days, they'd put all the instruments in the autoclave, some high, hot, heated, steamy kind of oven to sterilize all the stainless steel instruments. That's the kind of fire we're talking about here. So not a 
so much a punishment fire, but a healing fire. So, the encounter with him is the decisive act of judgment. Before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. This encounter with him as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. All that we build during our lives can prove to be mere straw, pure bluster, and it collapses. Yet in the pain of this encounter, when the impurity and sickness of our lives become evident to us, there lies salvation. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniably painful transformation as through fire. It is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. And then in this way, the interrelation between justice and grace also becomes clear. The way we live our lives is not immaterial, meaning it doesn't matter what you do. Everybody gets to go to heaven. Some people think that. You know, you can be a total wretch and you get to go to heaven. No, it counts. But our defilement does not stain us forever if we have at least continued to reach out towards Christ, towards truth, and towards love. So there's the justice side, but there's the mercy side. So God is just, but God is extremely merciful. He knows the depths of our heart. He knows the circumstances of our life. And so he sees a soul that has tried to live the faith. And so with that, he holds us accountable. But in his mercy, he's going to heal us so that we can go to heaven. Indeed, it has already been burned away through Christ's passion. At the moment of judgment, we experience and we absorb the overwhelming power of his love over all the evil in the world and in ourselves. The pain of love becomes our salvation and our joy. That's beautiful too, the pain of our love. So imagine, you know, you think of how kids get so excited about Christmas and when they see the presents under the tree, it's like they can't wait, but they have to wait. And that's what purgatory is too. We see the hope of having heaven. We see Christ. We feel the love but we still have to wait till we're healed. The pain of love becomes our salvation and our joy. It is clear that we cannot calculate the duration. So how long it is, we don't know. We're out of time again, meaning we're out of this time and space, of this transforming, burning, in terms of the chronological measurements of this world. The transforming moment of this encounter eludes earthly time, reckoning. It is the heart's time. It is the time of passage to communion with God in the body of Christ. The judgment of God is hope, both because it is justice and because it is grace. Beautiful passage. You know, this was, I forget exactly when Spes et Salve, Saved in Hope, was released. It's like, I think 2007 or 2008. But it's a wonderful portion of the document that this notion of purgatory truly does give us the hope we need because all of us are imperfect. So we can't just say, well, it doesn't matter what we do in this life, we get to go to heaven. No, it does matter what we do. And it matters that we continue to strive to say yes, and we repent of sin, and we continue to struggle to grow in holiness. But it also matters that our Lord loves us. He's going to heal us so that when we're ready, we can go to heaven. Now, with that all said, at the end of time, then, we have the resurrection of the dead. We profess this in the creed, the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the dead. Now, this isn't going to be some kind of night of the living dead, you know, where all these bodies, you know, ghouls and zombies and whatever else it may be, pop out of the grave. But some kind of mysterious transformation is going to take place. Christ came to save us, body and soul. That's why true God became also true man. Jesus, therefore, 
is going to unite us one day at the end of time, body and soul. We're a whole person. Whole person means body and soul. So even though when we die, the soul separates from the body, at the end of time, our Lord promised this resurrection of the dead. It must, to appreciate it, it must be something like he himself underwent on Easter. So on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. So, but, you know, there's no corpse, and Jesus appears to his apostles, not as a bloody corpse, but in this glorified sense. He can appear suddenly, he can disappear. He can be touched, so like Thomas can touch his wounds. He can eat, he can speak, and yet, again, just disappear. So it's hard to say exactly what this resurrected life is going to be, except we would say it's a radically transformed, glorified existence. So just as Christ rose body and soul from the dead on Easter, so we too will rise from the dead, meaning our body will be united with our soul. Now, we get into some distinctions here. So good old theology likes to always add some qualifications here. So at the end of time, those souls who are already in heaven, let's put heaven here. So heaven, purgatory, hell. So at the very end of time, whenever that is, the souls who are in heaven they stay in heaven, but, re, but united with their bodies. The souls in purgatory will go to heaven, being united with their bodies. The souls in hell, they stay in hell. For those of us here living on this earth, we will face judgment, and we're either going to go to heaven, or we're going to go to hell right away. So the purgatory part will be done with at the last final judgment. So the end of time. When, as Jesus said, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, what's going to happen with this body? So for all the bodies united with souls, then the body will be immortal and it will be incorruptible. Incor Uptable. For those in heaven, though, so for the heaven people, the body is going to have four qualities which try to describe this glorified existence. It's going to have what's called subtility, agility, clarity and impassibility. So, subtility meaning that it's going to be radically transformed. The body will become spiritualized. Sort of like our Lord's. Can appear, disappear, and yet could eat a meal, and so on. So it's going to be radically, perfectly spiritualized. Agility meaning you're going to be able to move about. Clarity, no defects. So that's really cool. No defects. And impassibility, no suffering. So it's really a, a glorious kind of existence. So soul reunited to a body that is has subtility, agility, clarity, and passability. That's for the people in heaven. The people in hell, tough luck. They don't get any of this. They are going to be stuck in wherever it is in hell, and they are going to have their defects, and they are going to suffer. Yes, they'll be immortal, because hell is eternal, incorruptible, they aren't going to die, but they are not going to have the glorification as the souls in heaven. So there you go. Now, any questions before we have some fun? I've got some real fun, too. Yes. 
Who? Who, what, where? Could be both. So like when I, so let's think, if you threw a rock and broke the window, you could say to me, oh, I'm sorry. What would I say to you? Oh, you're forgiven, but go pay for it, right? Or replace it. That's the healing of the hurt. Well, that's, and that can be part of it, that you know, some people have a hard time forgiving and letting go of the hurt, allowing the healing to take place. Now, it's not easy. You think of someone who may have faced some kind of an abuse, and the devil likes us to remember the hurts. He likes to keep the wound open. The devil would tempt us to have hate in our heart or hold in a grudge. But there we have to look to Jesus for that healing. I can give you a story if you want. The story is that this happened during World War II. Cory Ten Boom, she was a Dutch Reformed Protestant lady, and she and her family lived in Harlem, Holland, and they hid Jews. So they had a secret room, and they hid Jewish Jews and also some resistance the people that were caught behind lines or whatever. Well, one day, sadly, their neighbor alerted the Gestapo, and so the Gestapo came and eventually found the room tearing the house apart, but then also carried off the two parents, Corey and her sister. So the two parents were sent to one concentration camp, never seen again. Corey and her sister went to Ravensbrook, and the sister died because of mistreatment and typhoid and so on. But Corey eventually was, she survived. So after the war in the 1950s, she became sort of an emissary trying to preach forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing throughout Europe. She recorded that it was sometime in the 50s where she was giving this address in Germany. And at some point, she noticed that this man, who was like in the first or second seat, was one of the SS guards who was at Ravensbrook, who mistreated both Corey and her sister. And she said every you know, memory came back to her. And then after the talk, this SS soldier came up and he said, you know, it's a wonderful talk, and I too have found forgiveness, I've repented of my sins, and so on. And he extended his hand, and she said she froze. Now, she just froze. I mean, because every all you can imagine all the emotion, the memories that are going on. And then she remembered the words of the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. She said that by a great act of grace, she just put forth her hand, took his, but at that point, she said she finally felt released. That's a purification. See? So, I don't know if that helps, but, you know, there's, but we all have, we all have hurts. And we can either carry on the hurts or let go of them. Pope St. John Paul II always said that forgiveness puts a limit on evil. That's a beautiful idea because when we forgive, we aren't saying it didn't happen. We aren't saying the person is, you know, was right or something like that. We're saying, no, I forgive. This evil is not going to touch me anymore. It's not going to move on with the rest of my life. At that point, too, granted, Sometimes we have to keep saying every day, I forgive. That's all we have to say. I mean, I've been hurt sometimes in very, say, serious ways, 
And I just say, I forgive. Lord, help me to forgive. That's it. And think of what Jesus said from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. That's how we do it. But because of that prayer, a lot of healing graces come. And eventually we heal. But there's no sense of carrying on that hurt for the rest of our lives. Okay. Well, we're going to have some fun now. And the fun is this, that when I was in college, there was a Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who started doing research on what were called out-of-body experiences. So these are people who clinically die and then are brought back to life. Her research was what happens during that time of clinical death. So then in 1992, Life Magazine had this great article called Visions of Life After Death, The Ultimate Mystery. So, a few little excerpts. On the edge of eternity, I was deathly ill, shaking with fever when I arrived at the hospital. My temperature, and this is written by a woman, my temperature was almost 106, and I was having cardiac arrhythmias. I felt an incredible pain. The wall of my uterus was ripping apart. I was in septic shock going into labor. As I lost consciousness, I heard a voice shouting, I can't get her blood pressure. And then, within the tiniest fraction of an instant, I was out of my body and out of pain. I was up on the ceiling in a corner of the room looking down watching nurses and doctors rush around frantically as they worked to save my life. Then one of the doctors, really upset, yelled, begins with an S, and that somehow turned me over. Now I was in a sort of a tunnel, a cloud-like enclosure, a grayish opalescence that I could partially see through. I felt wind brushing against my ears, except I didn't have ears. I was there, but my body wasn't. I began to feel the most incredible, warm, golden, loving feeling, and the feeling was also a wonderful, warm, golden light. I was in this light, part of this light. There was a presence in the light, a wisdom, beautiful wisdom, you know, capital W, wisdom, Jesus, God, okay, and that wisdom was the final word. <laughs> the wisdom loved me, and at the same time, it knew everything about me. Everything I'd ever done and felt was there for me to see. That's judgment. I think the accounting of our lives. I wanted to proceed into the light and stay there forever, but I was shown that I had to go back and take care of my two children. In that same fragment of a second, I was back in my body, back in all the pain. My son was being delivered, and I heard everybody screaming, she's back. Mm. Interesting, right? Now, it's not a theological treatise, but you can see the theology there. Now, another story. So this was in, I found this in, in 2001, as my mother was at the doctor's, <laughs> so doctor's office reading. Interesting. But it starts, it's about a university professor named Howard Storm professor of art at Northern Kentucky University, who was in Paris with his wife, and all of a sudden, he has this awful pain in his abdomen. He's 38 years old. He felt like he had been shot. He was sent to the emergency room. His duodenum had perforated, flooding his abdominal cavity with burning digestive acids. Okay, so a perforated duodenum can be deadly. So he wrote this if not treated. The hospital was terribly understaffed, and I was to wait more than 10 hours before receiving proper attention. With my wife by my side, I lay helplessly in bed as the stomach acids consumed me from within. When at last I felt death approaching, I was grateful. At least now I thought the pain will stop. I whispered a tearful goodbye to my wife and closed my eyes. The very next thing I remember, I was standing next to my hospital bed. 
the pain all but gone. Looking more closely at the bed, I was dumbfounded to realize that I, or someone who appeared to be me, was still lying in it. Next to the bed sat my wife, numb with grief. I walked over and spoke to her, but she just kept staring straight ahead, completely ignoring me. I kept thinking, this has got to be a dream. But I knew that it wasn't. I felt more alert, more aware, and more alive than I'd ever felt in my entire life. I then heard voices calling to me from the hallway outside the hospital room. They were pleasant voices, male and female, young and old. I felt compelled to follow them. As I walked down the hospital corridor after them, I saw figures around me. They were vague, indistinct, as if on a TV with bad reception. Who are you, I called to them. The closer I got, the more they retreated. Gradually, I realized that they were malevolent beings. They approached and began to mock me, to push me, to pull and bite at me with long, sharp fingernails and teeth. It was without a doubt the most horrific experience I've ever been through. I hadn't said a prayer in my entire adult life. I was a 100% cynic, but what was happening didn't allow for disbelief. These beings, who I sensed had once been human and were now denizens of hell, were getting pleasure out of the torment they were causing me. They began to actually tear off and eat pieces of my flesh. A voice inside said to me three times, pray to God. And that's what I did. I started mumbling lines I remembered from my childhood, a jumble of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord's Prayer, the Pledge of Allegiance, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever I could think of. Then with everything I had, I yelled, Jesus, save me. Out of the darkness, a brilliant white light appeared. I felt arms embracing and lifting me. A love intense, a love more intense than any I'd ever courted ever known course through me. I felt that I was in the presence of Jesus himself with innumerable angels gathered all around us. I sensed that they could see right through me and I feared that they would recognize me for the person I really was, driven by selfishness, poisoned by cynicism and self-absorption. Deep down, I was no better than those hungry, hate-filled creatures that had taken such delight in causing me pain. I had a sudden urgent desire to repent a lifetime's worth of unbelief. I told Jesus and the angels around us that I didn't belong in their company, that I wasn't worthy. They said, we don't make mistakes, you do belong here. Their love for me was unconditional. I guess the best way to describe how it felt to be among them would be to compare it to a really big family reunion. You don't necessarily recognize everyone there, but you feel intimately connected to each and every person anyway. I definitely didn't want to go back to earth, but they told me it was not my time. I said that I understood. The next thing I knew, I was back in my hospital bed, covered in bandages, feeling like a truck had run over my stomach. At the last possible moment, the doctors had operated and saved me. And you know what he did after that? He changed his life. Right? So, interesting. Now, nothing dogmatic about those, but nevertheless, very interesting. And more and more of these kinds of stories surface in research. But the key is, though, that we live our life now. We look with hope to everlasting life with our Lord. But the key is to always follow the path. And even if we stray, we get back on the path. And this is why when you think about the church, we have a church that does teach, a church that offers sacraments that give us grace, like the Holy Eucharist that nourishes us for the journey, the sacrament of penance that heals us of these sins and gives us the strength to do better and to keep moving forward. So in all, it's not something that we need to fear, death will come, but rather to keep our eyes fixed on Christ, because that vision that we have now will eventually give way to the vision in heaven. All right, any other questions before we have our
discussion question. No? Nope. Pretty cool, isn't it? What do you think about it? I thought it was first. You know. Okay, you can take half, give you half. All right, so I'll leave this. So it's one question, and it's something for you all to ponder. 